It's one of the oldest wars in history. For billions of years, bacteria have been battling against a natural enemy, the virus. Normally, a virus would hijack the bacterial cell and take over its machinery, eventually becoming embedded in the host DNA. Here, it produces more virus and eventually overwhelms and kills the cell. Through evolution, however, bacteria have developed a natural defense mechanism against viruses. This phenomenon was eventually recognized as the bacteria's immune system and would later become known as CRISPR, a revolutionary technology that would allow scientists to manipulate this naturally occurring system to edit virtually any gene in an organism's genome. So here's how it works. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. The scientists that discovered CRISPR were awarded a Nobel Prize in 2020. What they found was a system within the bacterial genome that consists of short segments of repeated bacterial DNA. While these repeats are all identical, they are interspersed with spacer DNA. These are historical records of small pieces of virus material that have been collected and stored over time, throughout the bacteria's lifetime of encounters, so that it won't be attacked by the same virus again. When a bacterial cell is attacked by a new virus, the bacteria's CRISPR system has not encountered it previously, so it does not have the space that, that matches. The CRISPR system will transcribe a CRISPR-Cas enzyme to go and cut the invading viral DNA. It then copies the DNA into the CRISPR system, and the cell now has a memory of that virus. The defense mechanism starts with the transcription of a CRISPR RNA, that is, the sequence of repeats and spaces from the CRISPR array. Tracer RNA then links up with the repeat region of the CRISPR RNA through base pairing, and it is now known as the guide RNA. These sequences are trimmed to form a search complex with Cas9, an enzyme that cleaves DNA. Cas9 uses the tracer RNA portion of the guide RNA as a handle, while the CRISPR RNA spacer sequence directs the complex to the matching invading target sequence. The complex then searches the DNA for a particular region known as the protospacer adjacent motif, or PAM which is always located after each protospacer region in the target genome. This is an inbuilt safety mechanism, which ensures that Cas9 doesn't just cut anywhere in the genome. Therefore, genes that are not near a PAM cannot be targeted. However, PAM occurs quite frequently in the human genome, approximately every 50 bases, making it easy to target virtually any gene. It is a three nucleotide sequence consisting of one of the four nucleotide bases, followed by a GG nucleotide sequence. Once it locates the PAM, the Cas9 enzyme unwinds the target DNA, and then the guide RNA complements with the target sequence through base pairing. This triggers the Cas9 to change conformation and activates its cutting activity. Cas9 then cleaves the target DNA, inducing a double strand break. Through natural surveillance, the cell will notice the error in the DNA and try to repair itself. There are two methods of DNA damage repair in the cell, non-homologous end joining and homology directed repair. Non-homologous end joining is the more common pathway and it is faster, however it is error prone as the cell does not use a template to join the broken DNA ends back together. Given that some nucleotides are removed in the Cas9 cleaving process, repairing the ends together often introduces random mutations into the target sequence, which eventually inactivates the gene. The second type of repair mechanism is homology-directed repair, which is less error-prone, as it uses a homologous DNA template from a sister chromatid to accurately repair the break. This process can be manipulated by scientists to introduce a DNA repair template coding any particular gene of interest. The cell's repair machinery will preferentially use this synthetic DNA template to fix the break, thereby introducing a new gene into the genome. Now imagine if you could use this powerfully precise technology to manipulate or change any gene in the genome. Changing the genes within an individual, where the change ends there, is one thing, but having the power to permanently change multiple future generations 
of an organism is a completely different story. In many ways, science has moved much faster than what society was ready for. A worldwide moratorium has been called for fears of renewed issues around eugenics, safety, and human rights. But genome engineering also raises a huge ethical debate about the line between therapeutics versus enhancements. This line was crossed in 2018, when scientists in China edited the genomes of embryos in an attempt to edit a mutation and make them resistant to HIV. The cells were edited in vitro and then implanted into the mother, and twin girls were born. Germline editing has different regulations throughout the world, from ambiguous to restricted to guidelines and legislative bans. After announcing the research, the scientist has now gone into hiding. The identity of the twins is unknown, and we have no idea what other repercussions may have resulted from this editing. For example, we do not know whether they managed to edit all of the gene copies and cells in the embryos, if any other genes were affected, whether the right variant was even targeted, and we may never know. We simply don't know enough about the off-target effects, the potential for new mutations, how to safely transport the system to specific cells, or whether the body will even tolerate foreign DNA without any immune side effects. But these are challenges that may very possibly be overcome in the near future. Genetically enhanced food like drought and disease resistant agriculture, alternative sources of biofuels, reducing the carbon footprint, gene drives to eradicate malaria carrying mosquitoes, treating diseases like cancer with CRISPR enhanced T cells, removing rampant disease causing mutations, ending HIV, organ donor pigs, rapid DIY detection of COVID-19, these are just some of the applications currently being explored. Imagine if you could cure inherited genetic diseases like Huntington's, cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, sickle cell anemia, Alzheimer's, blindness, forever, or through pre-implantation genetics, enhanced characteristics in designer babies. What used to simply be science fiction is now very much a reality. The possibilities are endless. But where should we draw the line? Should humankind have the power to make permanent changes to human evolution or potentially disrupt the delicate balance in our complex ecosystem? Here's another thought. If CRISPR has actually been around for centuries, imagine what else is out there just waiting to be discovered.